Committee will please come to order. We're uh, still considering amendments to titles A and B. Mr. Barton, I believe you have an amendment you wish to offer at this time. Mr. Chairman, could we have a, a, a colloquy first before we go to that? Certainly. Um, I was not privy to the uh, fan club meeting out in the hallway. Could you brief the committee on what you told the world? We have um, tried to bring the Democrats together, and we wished we could bring you with us. <laughs> well, perhaps you we will. Part A first before we, you go to Part B. Perhaps we will. Uh, we're going to have a series of amendments. They will be shared and must be available for two hours in advance. That uh, will uh, include, uh, and we're looking at it as an overall package that will include uh, the Blue Dog Amendment and, uh, and several other amendments. And we so, hope uh, members will um, uh, look kindly so, on these amendments. Well, that's hope springs eternal. And um, perhaps some of them will be kindly looked upon. I hope so. Could you educate the committee on your timetable for uh, concluding for the today. markup? I would like to conclude the markup by 2 o'clock this afternoon. I know that's a very tight time frame, and there are lots of amendments. But if, uh, I think we ought to set that as a goal and try to stick to it. I would hope that we could, therefore, restrict the time for debate. Uh, we were doing 10 minutes on each side yesterday. Five on each side would be better. I have discussed this with you privately. You think that we shouldn't um, go to five on each side, but uh, officially, but, but try yeah. Encourage all members to stay within the that's, five that's, minutes on we each will, side. We will try to adhere to that, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, that's a with some exceptions, I think that will work. I think that will be very um, helpful. Are we to, are, can we now amend the bill at any point? No, we're still on A and A and B, but we will get to the full bill. Well, I have a transparency amendment in C that I think may be accepted. And uh, we, Congressman Congresswoman Eshoo has a biologics amendment with me also in C that we think will be accepted. We are going to get to all of these amendments. We do want to ask members to prioritize your amendments uh, so that uh, we can conclude our deliberations in the uh, er, afternoon. Uh, but all, all amendments will be considered. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With that understanding, um, we are all amendments will be considered within the time limits that we all have. I should. We clarify. are appreciative of the way you've conducted this markup, and we um, we do hope on the Republican side that it has a happy conclusion for all. Thank you. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I do have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3200 offered by Mr. Barton of Texas. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read and. Mr. Barton will be recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, one of the, um, the most um, controversial and contentious points in the, in the pending legislation is, is the, uh, the public plan. Now, the public plan is uh, put into the legislation to provide coverage uh, or insurance coverage for all Americans who currently do not have it for whatever reason. Uh, the problem with that is, as you have found out during the course of this markup, is that it's, it's very expensive, it's very controversial, it's very difficult to figure out how to put it together. There is an easier way. This amendment is not the only easier way, but it is an easier way. Uh, it would um, simply strike uh, subtitle B of Title II of Division A, which relates to the public health insurance option. So we take that out, and then we, we put in a guarantee uh, that we would help set up in each state a, what we would call a qualified state reinsurance program uh, and or a qualifying state high-risk pool. 
and we would uh, totally fund it with federal dollars so that every individual in that particular state uh, has the option to go in to this reinsurance program or this high risk pool uh, and get the insurance that they wish. It's that simple. Um, we believe that the, uh, the score on this over a 10 year period would be in the neighborhood of $16 billion. So it certainly is less than a trillion. And uh, it is simple, it is straightforward. Uh, we have every indication that it would work. There's no need for massive bureaucracy. You, would, you could use the existing state infrastructure that exists for, um, for the Medicaid and the S-CHIP program, if that's what the state wishes, or the state could set up a separate, um, a separate system if they wish to do that. So um, it's, if you, it's a two-page amendment or a three-page amendment. Uh, this, the, the, the state high-risk pool has to offer assistance for low-income individuals. It has to offer a variety of covered options. It must be funded with a stable funding source. Um, it has to cover all pre-existing conditions. And um, it's pretty straightforward. So I, I would hope that uh, you might look favorably upon it. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. I do, sir. Mr. Pallone. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I, I don't want to, I'm opposed to Mr. Barton's amendment, but I, I do want to point out that he has been um, a champion for individuals harmed by abusive practices like the rescission practices that uh, have been um, looked into quite a bit by the Oversight uh, and Investigations Committee. But I think that, the, the, Mr. Barton, that you um, kind of, I, I won't say don't understand, but don't um, believe in the uh, in, in, in the and what's so great about what we've done with this bill. I mean, I, I I'm so proud of this bill, and I'm so proud of President Obama because he's managed to get the insurance companies to come in and say that you know they'll support um, health care reform uh, and eliminate these discriminatory practices based on uh, health preconditions, based on gender, uh, whatever. Um, the fact of the matter is that the public plan and the exchange itself gives the, plan gives the people the choice of a new coverage option that does not have the track record of discriminatory behavior that many private insurers have exhibited. And this is one of the unique aspects of this bill that, uh, you know, we talk about it being an American plan. You know, it's not the British plan, it's not the French plan, it's not the Canadian plan, it's the American plan. Because what it says is that if you have insurance through your employer, or you have insurance through Medicare, or Medicaid, or the VA, or whatever you have, you can keep it. But we know that a lot of people don't have insurance. We know a lot of people go out and look for individual policies and oftentimes they can't get them because of preconditions or they're so expensive or small group plans that are too expensive and have all these discriminatory practices. And what we're doing here is setting up this exchange with both public and private insurers competing against each other that has eliminated these discriminatory practices and provides for affordability for, for several reasons. First of all, because now there's a large exchange and all the people that are participating in it in some ways are acting like a large group plan. They bring prices down. Then you have the competition between the public option and the other private insurers in the exchange that brings prices down even more. Then you have a subsidy for a lot of people that brings prices down even more. So for, very, for a lot of reasons, and the public plan is an important part of it, we're really creating affordability and eliminating discrimination. And the public plan is a very important part of that, not the only part of it. So what you're proposing simply isn't necessary. There's no reason to set up these high-risk pools or the other things that you're talking about and putting that burden on the states because the exchange accomplishes everything that you're seeking to accomplish. Mr. Pallone, would you yield to me? I yield to the gentlewoman. Thank you very much. Uh, I've been pretty quiet, but I've been taking it all in. Uh, I am a blue dog, but I call myself the unblue dog for purposes of health care. And uh, like Mr. Barton and many others on this committee on both sides, I strongly believe in the, the ability of markets to deliver the best health care. That is why I support a robust public option. Uh, as Mr. Pallone was saying, 
It can create pooled purchasing power to leverage lower prices, uh, multi-state drug purchasing pools. Uh, there are examples in the VA and DOD of how well this kind of thing can work. There's flexibility, incentives to innovate, uh, and, a, and competition. Uh, the public plan will, at the max, have about 30 million people in it. Many estimates are far smaller. So it won't be the dominant, exclusive uh, provider of health care. Right now, we have a market failure. We have one insurance plan in many, uh, I think, 50 percent of the markets in the United States, 94 percent, my uh, able colleague corrects me. Uh, that is obviously worse, far worse, than a market mechanism that will be generated by the public option. I wanted to name it something else. I somehow have always thought that sounds uh, a bit scary. But that's its name, and what it is is a way to drive competition, get prices down and quality up, and that's what we're all about in trying to report this, uh, this bill today. Thank you for yielding. Mr. Chairman, I, 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 Mr. Barton, the problem is you're such a pessimist. You have this notion that what we have out there is doomed to failure, and therefore you've got to set up these high-risk insurance pools. Uh, this bill is, is, is the most optimistic a wonderful thing that we could possibly achieve. And, and don't uh, take it down with this pessimistic attitude of, these, of this amendment. I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. Mr. Barton, for uh, closing on your amendment. Very briefly, Mr. Chairman. J the contrary to what my friend from New Jersey says, I'm an optimist. But I look at the um, CBO score on the public option in the current bill, and I see a trillion. Now, it's not all because of the public plan, but a big chunk of it is. Now, I look at this alternative, and I see uh, um, approximately $2 billion a year. If we can get the same bang for the buck, except only spend $2 billion bucks a year instead of $100 billion bucks a year, it would seem to me we would want to go with the uh, less expensive alternative. So, I'm, but I'm very optimistic. I think the market, uh, transparency, people, in a, you know, we doing it through the state infrastructure saves a lot of money in, um, in overhead. Um, with all respect, I think that is much preferable to something that in the public opinion polls uh, less than half the country says they won't. With that, I yield back. The, um, the vote now comes on the Barton Amendment, and I believe we are going to go to a roll call vote. Isn't it? So the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman? No. Mr. Waxman, no. Mr. Dingell? Mr. Markey? No. Mr. Mr. Dingell, no. Okay. Mr. Markey? Mr. Boucher? Mr. Pallone? Mr. Pallone, no. Mr. Gordon? No. Mr. Gordon, no. Mr. Rush? Ms. Eshoo, Ms. Eshoo, no. Mr. Stupak, Mr. Engel, Mr. Engel, no. Mr. Green, Mr. Green, no. Ms. Deget, Ms. Deget, no. Mrs. Caps, Mrs. Caps, no. Mr. Doyle, Ms. Harmon, Ms. Harmon, no. Ms. Joukowsky, Ms. Joukowsky, no. Mr. Gonzalez, Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee, Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin, Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Matheson, Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melanson, no. Mr. Melanson, no. Mr. Barrow, Mr. Barrow, no. Mr. Hill, Mr. Hill, no. Ms. Matsui, Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, no. 
Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space. Mr. Space, no. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton, aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall, aye. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Boyer. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Radonovich. Mr. Radonovich, aye. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bonomack. Ms. Bonomack, aye. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Burgess. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise, aye. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen votes no. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush, no. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak, no. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson votes no. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns is aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross votes no. Have all members responded to the call of the roll? This is an opportunity if anyone wishes to change his or her vote. Actually, about 13 or 14. <laughs> the clerk will report the vote. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 22 ayes and 35 noes. 22 ayes, 35 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. Ms. Eshoo, you have an amendment at the desk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk, um, 069, Eshoo, 069, Eshoo and Engel. May we get the division on that amendment, Do you, what division it's to, Ms. Eshoo? It, it's either A or B. Does anybody a, know a, if uh, the Eshoo amendment is A or B? It's just to B. To B. Thank you. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 3200 offered, <coughs> excuse me, by. Without Ms. objection, SU. the amendment will be considered as read. Gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Point Mr. of order, Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Louisiana reserves a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my colleagues, this. Um, uh, is a clarification of Medicaid coverage for citizens of freely associated states, which uh, most of you may not be familiar with. Uh, and I'll just spend uh, about a minute and then yield uh, to Mr. Engel, who is also offering this with me. Over the years, uh, the federal government has made treaty agreements with Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, and uh, Palau to allow their citizens to freely enter the United States without a visa or health certifications. They're called compact migrants. 
In exchange, the U.S. operates military bases on these islands. In years past, the U.S. tested bombs on these islands, which had detrimental health effects to the people living there, including their children and their children's children. They're allowed to arrive and, st and stay in any of the 50 states, and that state is required to pay for them with no federal assistance whatsoever. When the DRA was passed in 2005, the federal government stopped contributing Medicaid dollars toward compact migrant health care. So while states are not required to cover compact migrants, there are serious public health ramifications for not doing so. Uh, this amendment addresses uh, that gap, and I'm pleased to offer it. Uh, I think it's a worthy amendment. Um, uh, it really, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I can hardly hear myself speak. I don't think the committee is in order, Mr. Chairman. Gentlelady is correct. The committee will please come to order. Thank you for calling me young lady. I caught that. That's really a nice way to start the day. <laughs> uh, at any rate, um, uh, Hawaii has the highest number of compact uh, migrants due to its uh, proximity, of course. Uh, and uh, that state alone is spending $100 million a year in Medicaid dollars alone. Obviously, it's a huge burden. Uh, what I'd like to do is to yield to Mr. Engel and uh, I thank the chairman for uh, allowing us to offer this uh, amendment. I think it makes sense, it's practical, it's fair, especially given uh, the fact that the United States uh, uh, entered into this agreement with these islands so that they could operate military bases on them. Well, thank, I thank the, uh, the young lady for yielding to me. <laughs> we'll say it twice. And um, I um, am pleased to... Um, put forth this amendment uh, with her uh, at the behest of our, our colleague and friend, Mr. Abercrombie of Hawaii. Um, as Ms. Eshoo pointed out, uh, the, these are agreements made by the United States. And we talk a lot about unfunded mandates on the states. Well, this is an unfunded mandate if I ever saw one. Uh, we have treaty agreements uh, with these countries that people come over here to work. Um, the United States government, the federal government, signs these agreements, and then the states are left to, to pay for this. This isn't right at all. This should be uh, paid for uh, by the federal government. Um, compact migrants are allowed to freely come to the United States, uh, but the state in which they land must absorb their costs. That isn't right at all. So this amendment simply makes compact migrants eligible for Medicaid with federal matching dollars to help pay for them. Uh, that is uh, something that is very important. Now, we have treaty agreements with these, with these islands, um, and the people come over. And again, as Ms. Eshu said, they are called compact migrants. Now, we operate military bases on these islands, so it does have uh, national uh, security uh, implications. And so it is not simply uh, their people come over to here. Um, we are getting something in return. We have bases on these islands. This is something that is important to United States national security. And all we are saying is the states uh, should not be left uh, holding the bag. Um, if this is a federal agreement, uh, then the federal government needs to be responsible. So uh, I hope that um, uh, our um, colleagues will consider this amendment on a bipartisan basis. And um, if Ms. Eshoo doesn't have anything else to say, uh, we'll yield back the balance of our time. Mr. Chairman. Time has been yielded yield back. back. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Barton. I want to uh, insist on Mr. Scalise's point of order. This amendment uh, has jurisdiction with the uh, uh, Interior Committee. Uh, this bill has not been referred to the Interior Committee. Therefore, this, this amendment is not germane for the same reason uh, one of the amendments last night that uh, we offered was not germane. Uh, before the Chair entertains the point of order, uh, without objection, while we check with the parliamentarian, may we set aside this, um, sure. this issue because we do want to get a definitive ruling. Uh, with, without objection, the, uh, the uh, Eshoo Engel Amendment will uh, uh, be put aside and the pending matter which is before us is the point of order and we will put that aside as well. We will return to it as soon as the... Mr. Chairman, just objection here. I, I What's just that? want a clarification. Uh, we have indicated a point of order and uh, Mr. Barton has indicated our reason. 
and it is almost identical to what last night you made a decision on this. Well, point. rather than tell me how identical it is and how you well, think it is the right one, let me, let me find out from the parliamentarian uh, what, what, the, uh, what his view is, because we do rely heavily on the parliamentarian's views. But you seem. You but I want to put aside the debate on that issue. We will have a debate that. on the point. But you of seem order. to be able to make the decision last night pretty quickly. I don't understand why we have to put this aside, because it, it's absolutely identical to. We wanted to, to make sure the members of Congress had the same policy health care as the rest of Americans that were being put in this plan. We asked for an amendment on a vote on it. You would not allow the vote because you said it was not germane because it had to be referred to government administration and House you made the decision on the spot. I don't understand. This is absolutely identical. Why can't we use a parallel and you make the same decision that it is not germane? Gentleman, yield to me? Sure. Last night when that issue came up, uh, we called the parliamentarian to get uh, the ruling. Uh, I think that is the way to operate. We have to follow the rules whether it uh, comes out the way oh, I, I would like rules, for you. One, once the like. rule has been set, then you just follow the rule. And I think you established the rule last night, so let's just follow the rule. Uh, we'd like to see if the, if the same rule applies. Yeah, it may be a different rule today. You never know. <laughs> Do you need unanimous consent to delay this? I know that I'd like you to make a decision now. Because it seems pretty clear to me it's identical. And, uh, you know, we were slightly offended that uh, we couldn't offer this. The Ways and Means Committee. Mr. Stearns, will you yield to me further? Oh, sure. You can. I, I don't know why you should be offended. We're trying to follow the rules. I think you'd be offended if I didn't follow the rules. No, it's not a question of following the rules. The question is a precedent has been set. You made a decision, and this is identical precedent. So if you're talking in terms of legality, You've already had a precedent, so just follow the precedent, which is it's not germane. So I don't understand what's the big discussion on it. Someday you may be chairman of this committee, although I doubt you'll ever be on the Supreme Court. Uh, <laughs> let's uh, let's wait. Uh, uh, do some people think he should be on the Supreme Court, <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman. Parliamentary uh, inquiry. Uh, wait a second. I'm, uh, we're not uh, there yet. Let's let's don't waste a lot of time. We've got a lot of work to do. Uh, Okay, Mr. Chairman, just to compromise, how long are you going to take on this? Is it going to be a half hour or 10 minutes or a day? Well, we're inquiring. Do you want to stop work while we're inquiring of the parliamentarian or can well, we go on? Well, not necessarily, but it just it seems to me it's so blatantly obvious that this is not germane. Ask him when his plane leaves. Further parliamentary inquiry. Who's is the, the chairman, is yes, the chairman bound Spice. by the ruling of the parliamentarian? Pardon? Is the chairman bound by the ruling of the parliamentarian? It's a very strong uh, indication of, where, of, uh, of what the rule, the interpretation of the rules. That where is this parliamentarian, Mr. Chairman? Where is that person? Is that person behind? I'm going to recognize you to speak on the point of order. Do you want to speak on the point of I'll order? You're obviously doing that. Okay. You, you have your views. We'll have some debate, and then I'll make a ruling based on the parliamentarian's advice. Yeah, I don't want you to get upset. No, I'm not upset, well, and, but I don't want you to be uh, upset. Against the point of Because all I want to do is follow the rules. But isn't the parliamentarian right behind you, to the right of your No, shoulder? no, no. We have a House parliamentarian. Did you consult with that on the uh, last night on the? Yes. Uh huh. Because it seemed like you made that decision pretty promptly. I mean, that decision was made within three or four minutes, and we've already talked three or four minutes. It seems like that this is very simple to do. I guess the question for you, Mr. Chairman, what is the difference between this and last night that you can't rule without the parliamentarian? That would be the key question for you to answer. The question is whether I need a parliamentarian's view no, or not? No, no, no. The question is, based upon the decision last night, why can't you make a similar decision based upon that precedent? Why do you need a parliamentarian? Well, it, so well the gentleman yield. It, it's, well, the it, gentleman yield. Oh, well, let me. I, I just let the mis let the chairman have the time. The judge would like you to yield to him. The judge, okay. Mr. Stearns, don't you think it's fundamentally unfair to challenge the the chairman of this committee on his desire to get an interpretation on a rule from the parliamentarian? I think is that unreasonable to give him a few minutes to get an interpretation so that he can make an informed decision? I think it's fundamentally unfair to allow amendment to go forward that's not germane, and this. Amendment obviously is not germane. A precedent has been set, Judge. Which and you know, having been a judge, when you have a precedent, you follow the precedent. Well, let, so in this case, the gentleman would yield, and I don't know uh, exactly why you have the time, but 
<laughs> you gave him the title. But <laughs> the issue is this. It does depend on what committees a bill was referred to when it was introduced. Okay. And That's I want to I mean. find out if that rule uh, pertains in this particular case. Last night's ruling was uh, the fact that the amendment, which I supported, was not in order under the rules because the bill had had not been referred had not been referred to the Committee on House Administration, and therefore we would be legislating in that committee's jurisdiction. Now, the inference from that is that had the bill originally been sent to the House Administration Committee, that it might have been germane. I don't know if this bill had been originally referred to the Interior Committee uh, and what the parliamentarian's view would be of that matter. Uh, if, if you uh, want to play strictly by the rules and you don't want us to do anything else but talk about this issue, I'll ask the gentlelady to withdraw her amendment and we'll come back to it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just, you know, for the for the record, I, I just think that uh, especially Mr. Stern should know that uh, uh, the bill was introduced last year, H.R. 4000, uh, to reinstate these federal benefits, and uh, we went through the story of what happens in the agreements and and why we think that we this is a, a good, uh, a sensible case to be made, and it was it was exactly like this amendment, that legislation. And it did not, it was never uh, uh, sent to uh, or um, had to go to uh, the Interior Committee. So I, I just ask you to consider that if, um, if the Chairman thinks that, uh, that we should uh, withdraw and this will be, uh, you got a ruling? Mr. Chairman. I'm ready to, uh, uh, did Mr. you Chairman? want to withdraw it? Well, I want to, uh, what's the ruling? Let's, let, let's <laughs> Mr. We, Chairman. We have, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. The committee will come to order. Mr. Chairman. The committee will come to order. Uh, let's, um, I have just now had an interpretation from the parliamentarian. Now, then I would request you not withdraw your amendment. The amendment is pending. The point, point of order has been asserted. I want to recognize Mr. Scalise or Mr. Barton if you wish to um, elaborate on your point of order. If not, I think we know what the issue is and the parliamentarian has given me an interpretation and I'm ready to rule. And we're, we're invoking Rule 10, but I'll yield to uh, the ranking member. Um, I think I said what I wanted to say. I might ask the gentlelady from uh, California <coughs> if when her bill was introduced as a standalone bill, was it referred to any other committee than the Energy and Commerce Committee last year? Thank you. Uh, that it was not. It, there was no referral to uh, Interior. Mm -hmm. Going to we're, the point that Mr. We are told that it was referred also to the Ag Committee last year, which is not the Resources Committee, I mean the Interior Committee, but it was referred to another committee. Anyway, we're, we're ready to hear your ruling. Mr. Well, I, we've been informed by the parliamentarian that this particular amendment does not invoke the jurisdiction of the Resources Committee or any other committee, that it is within the jurisdiction of this committee. Yeah. And therefore, the point of order will not be uh, sustained. Do, is there further debate on the issue amendment? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barton, for what purpose do you seek recognition? I'll recognize your five minutes. To oppose the uh, issue amendment on policy grounds. The gentleman's recognized. Um, I want to make one comment on the ruling. Based on the ruling you just gave, would it be a, well, I, I'll, I won't ask that now, I'll ask that later. Um, we understand what the uh, gentlelady from California and the gentleman from New York are attempting to do, uh, but it does uh, call into question, uh, this would be an expansion of Medicaid. It would also waive certain rules that uh, citizens in the United States have to comply with, the five-year waiting period and things of this sort. Um, there should be another way to help these folks without uh, what in essence is waiving uh, current federal law and so we would oppose it on, uh, on policy grounds as well as on procedural grounds. Gentleman opposes the amendment. Is there further debate? Mr. Chairman. Uh, let's, Mr. Would, Mr. Chairman. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hall. I, I yield my time to Chairman Stearns. Yeah. Uh, I'll yield to you if I have the time, Mr. Chairman. 
You have yes, the time. Mr. Messier, I rise in opposition to this. Um, I don't think many members know where Palu is in the One, Pacific. Two, it's a very small country, and the capital only has about 600 people in it. Uh, it's a huge number of islands that stretch out. Uh, in fact, uh, supposedly 17 of the terrorists from uh, Gitmo, uh, Guantanamo Bay, are going to be sent there. And we're going to give them $200 million so that they'll take these terrorists. Now, their whole GDP is only about $64 million. So this is going to be a huge surplus to the country of Palu. Now, for the United States to step up and say that we're going to include them in Medicaid and allow them to bypass the five-year waiting period under the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act um, just seems a little over the top. I mean, I'm not sure that we need to do that. Now, Mr. Engel mentioned we have a military base there. Well, the military base is for their protection, too. I mean, it goes both ways. It's not just a one-way street. So I, I really think this is a huge amount of money we're giving to these folks, and uh, I just oppose the amendment uh, on the basis of, of why not let them wait the five years for the waiting period under the law. And so I just uh, think, uh, Mr. Chairman, that we should defeat this would, amendment. Would the gentleman yield? Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, right now, um, these people are, are getting what they need. It's just paid for by the states um, as an unfunded mandate. And I know my friend, because we've, we've talked for many years, is opposed to unfunded mandates. Um, this is not a matter of will these people get the aid, it's a matter of who will pay for it. And the question is, if the United States government entered into an agreement with these people, we, we may not like the agreement, but they entered into an agreement, shouldn't the United States federal government pay for it? It doesn't affect my home state of New York, it actually affects five states. It affects Hawaii, California, uh, Oregon, Washington State, and Arkansas. Um, so it doesn't affect my home state, but I think it's, it's fair and equitable that, that the federal government pay for something that they entered into and not put an unfunded mandate on the states. And I thank the gentleman well, for I, yielding to me. Well, I just say we got unfunded mandates across the board here everywhere. And I'm sure California, with this budget crisis, has unfunded mandates too. So is there any reason, Mr. Engel, why they couldn't wait the – why should we allow them to bypass the five-year waiting period? Well, because these agreements have been in effect for many, uh, many years, and um, the states are, are forced uh, to, to pay for this. So if we wait five years, it's just five more years of uh, the states paying for an unfunded mandate. Well, just with the economy here in the United States so uh, disheveled and, and we're in such a high unemployment across this country and we're bailing out all these people, should we go into Palu? who has such a low GDP, we're giving them $200 million to take 17 tariffs. I mean, isn't there some point where we just follow the law, wait five years, and then say, we'll consider it at the end of five years when the economy is well, better? Well, if the gentleman would, would, would yield. Just one last question. How much is this going to cost, then, the United States government? What's the total cost? I'm told it's $200 million over 10 years, um, scored by CBO. But I, I just want to say that that it's the federal government signed the agreements uh, allowing these people to enter the U.S. without visas and health screenings. Um, we signed that agreement with these people. We may not like the agreement, but it's a federal obligation. Well, gentlemen, uh, gentlemen's, time, I, gentlemen's time has expired. We've consumed five minutes on each side, but I would like to ask uh, uh, that we allow the gentlelady from the Virgin Islands to have uh, two minutes, and then we'll give anybody else two minutes, and then we'll go to the vote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I am in strong support of the Eshoo Angle Amendment. Uh, the people of Micronesia and the freely, the freely associated states are former uh, residents of trust territories of the United States. In some instances, such as the Marshall Islands, um, they have been uh, on the receiving end of many of our nuclear tests. Um, and have been remained loyal Americans through, loyal to this country throughout. Um, there is a compact agreement between the United States and these freely associated states, 
And I think the fact, the fact that they were trust territories of the United States, these are not um, immigrants from a totally foreign country. They have always, they, they historically had been part of this country as trust, um, as residents of trust territories. That the compact being in place that provides uh, assistance to those freely associated states, these uh, I believe that um, that forms the basis for supporting this amendment and uh, providing Medicaid to to the residents of the freely associated states who um, are allowed to freely um, migrate to the United States and are placing a, a really undue burden on the states where where they now reside. Would the lady yield for a friendly question? Yes. I, I yield. Uh, are we saying Palau or Palau? Palau, yeah. Palau, the, the Marshall in, Islands. Is that in the island in the South Pacific <laughs> where it was okay. bypassed already, but a general wanted to take we it? Just had a and 26,000 people died there, most of them Japanese. Pa is that the same place? Palau. Palau. One of the most beautiful islands in the Pacific. Yeah, yes. How can there be over five or 600 people there? Well. I think a lot of the people who have migrated, for example, to Hawaii and Arkansas are, are not from Palau or from Peleliu, but they're from the Marshall Islands, some of the poorest islands in, um, in Micronesia, um, and some that have really suffered uh, because of uh, the activities, the nuclear activities that we have um, done in those islands. Nothing. All time has expired. Would the gentlewoman yield? Who's Just 17 seconds. Oh, it's over. I just we go to, to a vote because this is we got a lot of amendments before us. These people pay taxes in the United States. So I think it's, that's important to note. Okay, thank you. Uh, all those in favor of the SU amendment say aye. Aye. Oppose no. no. The ayes have it. The amendments agreed to. Now we go to your side. Who has an amendment? Mr. Shadding. Mr. Shadding. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. It's uh, Shadig 17E. Mr. Chairman, can I reserve a point of order? <laughs> Gentleman from New Jersey reserves a point of order. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Shadig of Arizona relating to other requirements. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment is to a stealth provision of the bill. It's a provision of the bill that no one has talked about in the press and no one has talked about in this room. It's a provision I'm betting that no one here really knows is in the bill or what it does. Under current law, if an ERISA governed plan, that means a union plan or an employer plan, negligently or even willfully and in bad faith denies coverage to an employee and that employee is either injured or killed by the denial of coverage, that employee can recover nothing for their injuries, nothing even if there's a wrongful death. Now, one would think that that's the kind of injustice that Congress would want to correct. No one uh, in America should be left to suffer a loss like that from the wrongful denial of coverage and recover nothing. But this bill not only doesn't fix this problem, it literally preserves and extends it. This injustice is best illustrated by a case called Corcoran versus United Healthcare. In that case, late in her pregnancy, Florence Corcoran was ordered hospitalized by her doctor. He told her that if she wasn't hospitalized, either she would die or her baby would die. But United Healthcare refused to cover her hospital stay. They said they would only offer home nursing services. Tragically, Mrs. Corcoran's treating physician was right. At a time when there was no nurse at home at the Corcoran's house, Mrs. Corcoran went into labor and her baby went into distress and died. I hope my colleagues are listening carefully. Even more shocking, when the Corcorans sued United Healthcare, they learned that United Healthcare had hired its own expert to review her records. And United Healthcare's expert had written to United Healthcare saying, exactly what her treating physician had said. If she, would not, if she was not hospitalized, either she would die or her baby would die. And nonetheless, United refused to provide coverage. But here's the kicker, even more shocking. The court ruled that notwithstanding United Healthcare's outrageous conduct, 
Mrs. Corcoran and her husband could recover nothing for the death of their child, absolutely nothing. Why? Because the United States Supreme Court, in a case called Pilot Life, had ruled that under Section 514 of ERISA, the Corcorans could recover nothing for their injury. In this bill, we do not fix the injustice of Corcoran versus United Healthcare or Pilot Life. We preserve and protect Section 514. Don't believe me? Open the bill to page 49 and look at lines 19 through 22. We apply Section 514 of ERISA to future plans. This committee has defeated amendment after amendment to provide medical doctors with some slight form of liability protection. But in this bill, we extend and preserve immunity for ERISA-governed plans, a, an injustice which leaves people like the Corcorans with no remedy. Now, I know there are unions across this country that support this bill and think it's a good thing to do. I wonder if they know that they are exposing union members to this kind of an injury. I know that the American Medical Association has come out in support of this bill and said that they think it's a good idea. I wonder if they know they're supporting a bill that makes doctors liable but ERISA plans immune. And I wonder if my colleagues on the other side of the aisle know that they are voting for immunity for ERISA plans that not only negligently refuse to provide coverage, but willfully and in bad faith refuse to provide coverage. My amendment simply uh, removes this injustice uh, and provides that no plan should be able to be immune. And with that, I'd be happy to yield to my friend, Mr. Terry. Thank you, Mr. Shattuck. This is a good amendment, and frankly, it's the uh, heart of a long-running debate about the responsibility of uh, the administrators of plans. This fixes what the courts have deemed an immunity for these plans caused by the language within the ERISA law. Uh, so this protects patients. This is consumer-oriented. Uh, fixes a long-running problem, uh, and because the uh, bill opens up ERISA, of course you can't do any federal exchange uh, without discussing ERISA because this in essence replaces ERISA. Could you yield to Mr. Burgess? And uh, so this is germane, and I would love to yield back to you so you can yield. Dr. Burgess? I would just very quickly point out, for those who have cried crocodile tears for limiting people's ability to go to the courthouse and recover damages, this is a huge, huge problem. But more importantly, there is also an ERISA exemption that does allow some people access to the courthouse that specifically would be members of Congress. I will yield back to the gentleman. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Green? Mr. Chairman, I, having read the amendment having problems in the past because I represent a district that has a great number of multiple them employers that come under the ERISA. I understand where they are coming from, but I have some concern about our jurisdiction if I can ask the well, chairman. Well, I thought ERISA was under ed and labor. It, it, yeah, that is a problem, uh, Mr. Shattuck, <laughs> that uh, this particular amendment says specifically that we are uh, referring to the ERISA law, and that is not within the jurisdiction of this committee. I would, uh, I am, I support your amendment. I think it's a good amendment, and I feel badly that we can't take it up. But we do have jurisdictional limits, so uh, I don't know if you want to withdraw it or I'll have to sustain a point of order. I understand from your prior, if I could be heard on the point, Mr. Chairman. Well, okay, I'm going to uh, okay. just to be I, procedural. I've been Mr. Chairman, I didn't raise a point, or I just questioned it because I know. No, but Mr. Uh, Mr. Pallone did raise a point of order, Good. and I, okay. I assume he's asserting the point of order, and so that point of order is before us, and I'd like to recognize you on that point. Well, let's hear what the point of order is. Well, All I heard was Pallone reserve a point of order. We'd at least like to hear yeah. what it is. Well, the point of order, if if I might speak for you, Mr. Pallone is that it, it is not within the jurisdiction of this committee and therefore not germane to the bill because it amends the ERISA statute and that is just not within our jurisdiction. Was, can, Mr. Can we, uh, if Mr. Barton wants to finish or I would be happy well, to make my comments. I would like to be recognized on the, if Mr. Shattuck doesn't want to be recognized. I, I do want to be recognized, yes. but I would just soon go, let you go first, Mr. Chairman or Mr. Well, Ranking here's, Member. You know, this is an unusual situation, Mr. Chairman. Last night we had an amendment by Mr. Blunt on covering 
that whatever the public plan is, that members of Congress had to be included in that plan. And you were eloquent that you supported it, but you were constrained because of a point of order that you couldn't accept it. Now, Mr. Shattuck has put up an amendment that you also seem to be very supportive of, but again, you're constrained because of a point of order. Um, if the majority doesn't make a point of order, we can do whatever we want to do. Uh, a point of order is only valid if it's insisted upon. If you really are for this, uh, I would suggest that you ask Mr. Pallone to, re to uh, remove his point of order. Let's have a debate on the policy and see where the votes are, because that is acceptable under the rules. So, Why don't you yield to Mr. Shattuck and then I'll respond. Uh, I'll be happy to. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. Um, Quite frankly, let me make a couple comments on the substance. I am stunned this provision is there. I think there are questions to be asked about how this language got in the bill. This language. The matter before us is the point of order. This language extends immunity uh, and is, I think, of immense dollar value to some insurance plans. And interestingly, a number of insurance plans across America have said they like this bill. And what they're getting out of this bill, they've said, is they're getting uh, um, an individual mandate and that they are willing to accept for an individual mandate, a requirement that we, ha that we have a guaranteed issue and community rating. I wonder if perhaps what they're getting that nobody's talking about is immunity. And I wonder if they're being candid with the American people because they've cut a deal here to extend this immunity. Okay. ERISA was decided 22 years ago, and there have been numerous opinions since then in which judges all over this country have called for the Congress to fix this. And indeed, uh, Members of Congress have tried to fix this injustice. Now when we have a chance to fix it, we're not fixing it. We're giving those insurance companies immunity. I think it's a little odd that we allow insurance plans under ERISA, just some insurance plans, absolute immunity when they injure or kill somebody. But boy, we can't give doctors any protection, not even the slightest little bit of protection. Quite frankly, Mr. Chairman, I think you're correct. I think this is not in the jurisdiction of the committee. Uh, it is clearly an amendment to ERISA, uh, but I'd like to know uh, what deal is behind it, uh, and I'd like to tell, make sure the American people know that somehow somebody slipped something in here in the dark of night, and that's why some of us have been saying it's really important to slow down and look at these provisions, because I think Mr. and Mrs. Corcoran got a raw deal, and sadly there are lots of other people like them across America. Mr. Chair Mr. Chairman, on the point of order. Uh, yes, who seeks just, recognition? Just briefly. Uh, of clarification, the, when we appeal to the House parliamentarians, it's, my, it's under my understanding that it is advisory to you and it is the chair's right to rule as the chair sees fit. Is that not the rules? Uh, the chairman makes the ruling. But that, the president I, I, I is back my time then. Mr. Chairman, uh, you don't, I'd like to may, may I answer your question? You did. The chair makes you the did. ruling, but the president is to follow the, pro the parliamentarian's recommendation. Uh, I'm not sure that's true, Mr. Chairman, Mr. and the committee and other chairmen of this committee. Mr. Boyer, on the point of order? Yes, yes, sir. The gentleman's recognized. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I respect mm -hmm. the discretion of the chair. The challenge that you've had here in exercising your leadership to navigate this bill is that not all committees of the House obtain jurisdiction of the bill. And there have been amendments presented which are good and perfecting amendments which I know that you also would like to adopt. The challenge that you're going to have, Mr. Chairman, is, is how we, you go then to the Rules Committee to combine these, these bills that have come out of three committees. So what we have here, uh, Mr. Chairman, not. I will, ha I will be bringing amendments from that deal with the Veterans Affairs Committee. There are amendments that deal with the Armed Services Committee. So when we come to this, my, my appeal to you, Mr. Chairman, is, is I, I believe you in your, your sincerity when you said this is a problem that you would like to work on, but you, you're restrained by the parliamentarian. I, I would you know, keep a side list uh, of uh, amendments that we would like to work with you as we go to the Rules Committee to perfect the bill. And, and I yield to Mr. Shattuck. I think that's probably the best way that we can do this, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have something I want to add. I, I think if you rule this is not germane, it is a correct ruling. It's not in our jurisdiction. I would only urge my, I, I would be happy to work with you, and I would only urge my colleagues on the other side, uh, if you vote for this kind of language, don't be shocked when you get home uh, in the August break and you're asked, well, why are you voting to extend immunity uh, to plans that, for example, can injure or kill people when they deny coverage, including 
people in union plans. Okay. Uh, that that's a pretty right. severe thing to be right. doing. Re Would the gentleman yield? Mr. Chairman, chairman. Can, who seeks recognition? Mr. Green. Mr. Chairman, I do think that uh, it's not the correct jurisdiction, but I understand the need because we've had problems with it in my own area. I have a lot of multi-state employers and that immunity. This bill doesn't do anything except carry that immunity forward. It needs to be corrected. And I'd love to work with my colleagues on the other side and find someone on Ed and Labor, both on the Republican side and Democratic side, who would be sensitive to that. And, uh, but uh, I don't know if we have much choice except to carry that immunity forward uh, since we don't have jurisdiction over dealing with it. And I'll would the go back my time. Could, could, could we move on? Because uh, we've got a lot of work to do today. The chair is, is prepared to rule on the point of order. The chair reluctantly has to follow the rules. I know we could, without objection, without a point of order, legislate in any other committee's jurisdiction, but that's so contrary to what the House of Representatives and the committee system is all about. And I wouldn't want other committees legislating in our jurisdiction uh, if, they, uh, if they just do it by some kind of collusion. That's right. The rules are the rules. The chair must rule that this amendment is not germane because it legislates in areas that are not within the jurisdiction of the committee. No. Point of personal privilege? I don't have it. Uh, I don't want to recognize you for point of personal privilege. We're uh, now entertaining amendments. I'll be pleased to go with you to the Rules Committee. And urge All I want to say is if people want copies of Corcoran versus United Healthcare, I'd be happy to give them copies. Uh, I, I appreciate your statement. Uh, Mr. Green, you have an amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to call up Green Amendments 4, 5, and 10 and Sutton number 10. The uh, clerk will report the amendment. This is an in block amendment that actually was. Uh, Submitted as, a, as one amendment within the time frame, and I, I think the clerk will confirm that. Can I ask the clerk if the um, amendment is in order with? Uh, within Division A or B and is, you know, filed within the two hours. Yeah. yeah. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Chairman, can I, may I proceed? Uh, has the clerk... Uh, the amendment be uh, considered as read. Gentlemen, uh, in order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I'll try and be as brief as we can because I know both sides have a lot of amendments. Uh, the first, uh, the first pr uh, provision deals with uh, abdominal aerobic aneurysms that Congressman Shimkus and I have been working on uh, because of the cost of the bill. Uh, we have a study, and this is something I've been working on, I know a number of members have for many years. To, to date, the utilization of the AAA screening in Medicare is very low. This can be attributed to the Medicare beneficiaries only having one year to get a welcome Medicare exam. As a result, less than 10,000 Medicare beneficiaries look take advantage of the, uh, the AAA screening since 2007. The amendment requests HHS to conduct a study on barriers to access. Would gentlemen, yield. Yes. We're prepared to accept all three amendments. Uh, well, actually, four amendments. I uh, only have three. Okay. Well, it should be. Uh, Amendment number four was the AAA. Anem amendment number five is a quality measure section uh, uh, that really supports the development quality measures as GAO out study outlined in the bill. And I don't have a specific concern, but it was the president of impairment. I want to make sure that the GAO, the term president, presence of impairment so that we can actually measure impairments such as hearing, vision, and, and speech. Did you, I think that well, the work. gentleman suspend. Um, we really only have three amendments. I just want to make it clear we know what we're what, Mr. Chairman, here. I apologize. Okay. The, um, the we did not hear the Sutton amendment. Okay, so amendment. it's not the Sutton amendment. I thought it was included, uh, Mr. Chairman. We've got With, with that, I'll uh, accept the minorities on the three that I've called up and withdraw my number 10 from Ms. Sutton, who I'm a co-sponsor of, Betty. I thought we were doing it. 
Okay. Let me just make sure we understand what we are voting on here and agreeing to. We have got an amendment. Um, Green 3200 in reason. section 1192C1A, insert impairment after outcomes. We have green, the green 001XML dealing with the report to Congress on barriers to preventive services. Mr. Chairman, I can't hear. Uh, the committee is not in order. Um, if the gentleman was suspended, can I ask the clerk to review again what the three amendments are that we are considering now? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, we are now passing out the Sutton Amendment 10 underscore 001, which was not passed out with the other three green amendments. We had green 5 underscore 001. We had green, green five, 4, 5 and 10. 5 and 10, exactly. Okay. Are we just going to are you supportive of the Sutton Amendment as well, or you just want to do the three green amendments now? We, we have seen the Sutton Amendment, and staff tells me we are also okay with it. All right. Can we consider those together at this time? As, um, those ask unanimous consent that all four amendments be considered in block and be accepted unanimously. Okay. Without Thank objection, you, so ordered. Is there any further debate on this since they have been agreed to on both sides? Okay. Without Further debate will call the question. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. And the, the uh, amendments are adopted. Uh, we'll next go to the uh, minority side. Mr. Whitfield. Thank, uh, I have an amendment at the desk, uh, Whitfield O2C. Clerk will report the amendment. One moment, Mr. Chairman. And I'll ask again if the amendment is within the divisions and is timely with the two hour notice. It is, Mr. Chairman. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a subsidy. Without HR objection, 30. the amendment would be considered as read. And Mr. Whitfield, you recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, chronic pain continues to be a major health problem in the U.S. Interventional pain management physicians are the ones that primarily deal with this issue. And procedures to deal with chronic pain are primarily done in ambulatory surgical centers and or hospital outpatient uh, clinics. CMS has made a decision that they are going to reduce the reimbursements to interventional ma pain management physicians in 10 of their most 11, uh, of, of 11 of their most prevalent procedures. In fact, in 2009, they are going to receive a reduction of about 27 percent and over the, five, uh, over the next five years, a cumulative total of a little over 100 percent. Now, the I issue here is that GAO has determined that it is more expensive to do these procedures in hospital outpatient clinics than it is in ambulatory surgical centers. So we feel that if... Um, I can hardly hear. I would ask members to uh, either sit down or go to the cloakroom so we can continue. Thank you. Gentlemen, continue. So we feel if the, uh, these uh, procedures, if they continue to reduce the re reimbursement on these procedures, you're going to have more procedures done in hospital outpatient clinics, which will increase the overall cost of health care. This amendment is very simple. It simply provides a moratorium on these reductions for two years until additional studies have been completed, and I would urge uh, the members to support this amendment. And I would yield to the gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Stupak. Well, I thank Mr. Whitfield for yielding, and I'm glad to join him in this amendment. Uh, he is right that uh, ambulatory service centers, with those who deal with uh, pain intervention, is facing basically 135 percent cut over the next five years. In fact, this year it's about a 27 percent cut. As we're trying to straighten out this health care uh, dilemma we find ourselves in, I don't think one area or one certain group should take uh, significant cuts in, in, in the reimbursement rate. We do have. Uh, public option, which is Medicare, 
uh, reimbursement and for physicians Medicare plus 5 percent, but when you start cutting 27 percent out of one area, it's, it's a little bit much. And the other thing I'd point out is, as Mr. Whitfield indicated, these are pain management specialists. Uh, if they're not going to these specialists, they're going to be going to the emergency rooms, they're going to be going to other parts and seeking other services. So if we just put a moratorium until we see what the final outcome is going to be here, that is probably the most prudent way to do it and people can still get their relief and at the same time we can still reimburse at a, a fair rate of uh, reimbursement. And I'd yield back, so I'd hope we'd support this amendment. I'd yield back to my friend from Kentucky. Mr. Whitfield. Thank you. Uh, yield back. I yield back. Yield, Mr. Whitfield yields back. Uh, does anyone else uh, which, wish to comment on the uh, Whitfield Stupac amendment? Okay. Uh, then we'll call the question on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? The ayes have it and the amendment is adopted. Do we have an amendment on the uh, majority side? Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Engel. Mr. Chairman, I have uh, three amendments at the desk. They are Engel 6, Engel 3, and Markey 5. You ask they be considered together? Yes. Clerk will uh, report the amendments. Well, if we're not doing anything yesterday, you're still making up for lost time. <laughs> amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3200 offered by Mr. Engel of New York and Ms. Tchaikovsky of Illinois. At the end of subtitle C of titles. I ask that the um, amendments be considered as read. Again, um, I'll ask if they are in order pursuant to the division and timely pursuant to the two hours. They, they are, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Mr. Engel is recognized for five minutes in support of his amendments. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today I'm offering two amendments. Uh, the first uh, is with my good friend, uh, Ms. Capps of California, to simply extend important child health quality improvement provisions of CHIPRA to two Medicaid populations, which are traditional eligible childbearing women and newborns and other covered adults younger than age 65. As we look to improve value and cost containment in the underlying bill, uh, our amendment will help us with these important goals. Medicaid now pays for 43 percent of births in the country, and 29 percent of hospital charges to Medicaid are for childbearing women and newborns. In fact, material newborn care is the most expensive Medicaid hospital condition. We simply want to make sure that we're spending our federal funds wisely on quality care. Secondly, I have worked closely with my good friends, Congressman Schakowsky and Congressman Ralph Hall, on an amendment that is strongly supported by both the American Academy of Ophthalmology and the American Optometric Association. And if you know, these two groups have, have clashed repeatedly, so to get both of them on board for this, uh, this must be a good amendment. Our amendment requires Medicaid coverage of the medical services furnished by an, an optometrist. It does not mandate that states cover extra benefits like eyeglasses would remain an optional benefit under the Medicaid program. It also does not expand provider scope of practice. I am a strong supporter of the quality work that the optometrists in my district and in New York do. I had the pleasure recently of visiting with David Heath, president of the SUNY College of Optometry, and know that we need more people like him providing access to quality health care services. So I would urge my colleagues uh, to support all these amendments combined, and I yield to my good friend, Congresswoman Schakowsky of Illinois. Thank you so much, Representative Engel, for your leadership on this issue. Um, I'm glad we were able to work on a bipartisan way and a, that was agreeable to all parties. I want to thank my colleague, Representative Hall, for co-sponsoring both the original bill and this uh, amendment with us. And I also want to thank Representative Sullivan for joining us on this amendment. We know that providing access to comprehensive eye exams is the best way to diagnose eye and vision problems. And providing access to vision services helps ensure that we identify problems early and give children and adults the care they need. We but to ensure that people have access, we need to ensure Would, uh, that they're... Would Gentlelady of Illinois yield? Yes. Um, the minority is prepared to um, accept these amendments? I yield back. Okay. Could the... Would, would the gentlelady yield first? 
I, I yield to um, Representative Hall. Yeah, I want to thank you and thank the American and Academy of Ophthalmology for making and providing for some treatment for Medicaid in the same or similar manner that they've treated Medicare since 1986. It's a good amendment. I want to, if you would, yield to Congressman Sullivan for one minute for his comment. I yield back yeah. my time. Um, you, thank you, Congressman Hall. Um, Mr. Chairman, I support the ingalls sikowski hall amendment. I think it is a good amendment and helps to provide necessary vision services and protect state scope of practice laws in Medicaid. A licensure and scope of practice have always been defined in the state and, and never at the federal level. Any federal legislation to mandate provider status under Medicaid should be limited to provider scope of practice as defined by state law. This amendment mandates provider status under Medicaid program for the medical services provided by optometrists without expanding provider scope of practice and leaves these important decisions to the states. While we want to make sure that Americans have access to vision care services, we also want to make sure that the federal legislation requiring state Medicaid programs to reimburse optometrists for their services does not place additional financial burdens on states by inadvertently expanding provider scope of practice. This amendment strikes the, this balance. I encourage adoption of this amendment and I yield back. M Mr. Chairman, reclaiming my time, uh, I thank the gentleman. I'd like to yield to Ms. Capps. Thank you uh, my, to my colleague, uh, Mr. Chairman. This comprehensive amendment would also ensure that the quality of maternity care in this country is being measured in Medicaid and, and CHIP programs. The United States lags far behind other industrialized nations in terms of maternal health. In fact, when it comes to maternal mortality rates as ranked around the world, we are tied with the country of Belarus. We are ranked number 41. One of the reasons our country has struggled to improve our rates is because we lack well-coordinated data and information dissemination on maternity care. By including maternity care measures in Medicaid and CHIP, we can do a better job of ensuring that we are collecting necessary and ensuring that providers uh, collecting necessary information and ensuring that providers are following evidence-based maternity care guidelines. Thank my colleagues for their work on this language and urge us all to support the amendment. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Barton. I have unanimous consent request. We have a uh, have new to. member on the Republican side that's joined us, Mr. Boehner, and I would ask unanimous consent that he be added to the committee on the minority side <laughs> for the remainder of the markup with full voting privileges. Is there an objection to that unanimous I, 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 I've heard one <laughs> from Mr. Boehner. <laughs> We're glad to have our leader here. We welcome the Republican leader to our committee. The vote now comes on the, uh, the angle caps amendment. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it and the amendment is agreed to. Mr. Walden. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have two amendments I'll offer in block. They are Walden 3 underscore 001 dot XML and Walden 2 underscore 001 dot XML. To the relief of the committee, uh, they have nothing to do with Woody Biomass. <laughs> Although we were going to offer one for prosthetics so that everyone would have wooden, no. Uh, moving on. No, we, we don't move on. Let's get the clerk uh, to find the amendment that we can get it under, fully under consideration. There are two amendments. Walden 3 and Walden 2 will offer them in block. Mr. Chairman, I'm in forward. We don't have Walden 3. What? I mean, which one? We have Walden 3. They're looking for Walden 3. Are they, they were. Are uh, they both to Division Three? Um, I mean, one is to Division B, B and one is to Division A. Oh. But we were told we could mark, we could okay. uh, do them in block if that's. Yes. We're going to consider the amendment as read. Okay. And uh, if the gentleman will make his comments, uh, we're going to accept it with some caveats or some ex uh, statements. So if you want to be brief Perfect. on your op uh, comments, I'll be very brief, Mr. Chairman. Um, these amendments um, are, are similar to legislation that Representative Pomeroy and I uh, introduced along with 59, 58 of our colleagues, including a number from this committee on both sides of the aisle, that simply say that when it comes to MedPAC and now to this new health commission that would be established in the bill, 
that there would be a proportionate representation of practitioners who are actually practicing in rural areas uh, equivalent to the population of the country. So that it, it works out to about 25 percent of the makeup of MedPAC, where this Health Commission would be practitioners who practice in the rural areas so that they can have a voice about what it's like to provide health care services in the rural areas. I know Mr. Stupak had indicated his support of the legislation, and I believe Mr. Welch is also a co-sponsor, along with Representative Baldwin and others. And so, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would would gentlemen yield? To I would me? be happy to yield to the chairman. Uh, MedPAC already has a requirement like this. Section 1805 of the uh, Social Security Act mandates that MedPAC have broad geographic representation and a balance between urban and rural representatives. Adding this new requirement would uh, uh, be redundant, but I'm uh, also open to accepting this and looking into it further. And also, I support a uh, balanced and robust. Benefits Advisory Committee, but we don't want this committee to become ineffectual. It's a balance. I support this amendment, but we will have to take a bigger, bigger look at it uh, as we move forward, and I want to work with you. And, and I'd be happy to work with the Chairman. Mr. Chairman, right now, despite the statutory requirement, MedPAC currently only has two rural commissioners, and uh, I believe only one of them is actually a practitioner, and they've had some issues in, in working on community access hospital issues and all that the one practitioner wasn't there. They went on for a long time. When she finally was able to weigh in, uh, they dismissed the whole thing they were working on once they got her input. And so we're just trying to get some balance. I know that on page 31 of the uh, legislation, there is a long list of requirements for participation in the commission, uh, dealing with all kinds of specific areas. We're just looking for uh, that rural voice because the unique nature of uh, delivering health care in the rural areas. And I, I appreciate the chairman's uh, support of this amendment. Thank the gentleman for his amendment. Let's proceed to a vote. All those in favor of the Walden Amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it and the amendment is agreed to. Uh, Mrs. Capps. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, have an amendment at the desk, a comprehensive amendment or a shared amendment, uh, number 40002. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3200. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The lady from California is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is the Waxman Welch Caps combined amendment. Uh, I'll start off. As we move, make a move toward wellness based health care instead of illness based <laughs> disease treatment, we need to be sure that we are incentivizing people to seek primary and preventive care. By prohibiting cost sharing in Medicaid for the most effective and proven preventive clinical services, we will save money and lives. These services include cervical cancer screening for women, sickle cell disease screening in newborns, and blood pressure screening for adults 18 years and older. These measures are not only common sense, they are proven to work in preventing diseases which are extremely expensive to treat. I will give one example that every parent knows about, and that is the advantages of screening young children for their vision before, as they prepare to enter school. If we can ensure that there are no financial barriers to receiving these services, we can ensure that more Americans are going to take advantage of them. This amendment is supported by the Partnership for Prevention, the Trust for America's Health, and the American Heart Association. I urge colleagues to support this amendment and, and ensure that we don't stand in the way of individuals seeking preventive care, and I am happy to yield to the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welch. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, this amendment is very important to the State of Vermont uh, because Vermont entered into a very unusual arrangement with the Federal Government. Uh, instead of having our Medicaid payments be totally tied to the number of people on Medicaid, we entered into a long-term five-year stable agreement uh, where Vermont took on some risk uh, that it might be eligible for more money but in exchange receive flexibility from the Federal Government uh, in the ability to manage our program locally. And it's actually worked out. Uh, and it was an uh, arrangement that was in, entered into between a Democratic legislature and a Republican governor. 
Uh, both sides felt that if we had flexibility at the local level to administer this program, uh, we would be able to develop some efficiencies and be able to provide benefits to folks uh, without uh, sacrificing access. And we have been successful doing it. This amendment essentially allows us to maintain what has been a federal state partnership. And then within Vermont, our program has been a partnership between uh, public and private insurers. Mr. Chairman, we haven't even received all of this amendment. The, the, the little bit we have gotten we are okay with, but we at least ought to see the amendment that they are talking about. Gentlemen, yield. You, you make a good point. It looks like we had the wrong amendment distributed. We will have the correct one uh, distributed forthwith. Uh, but if the gentleman would permit, let us continue the uh, debate. And we well, is, go to essentially the amendment is respectful it. of arrangements that have been made uh, by States who have taken some uh, steps uh, to provide access to health care to their citizens. And it allows the implementation of the bill that is under consideration uh, to be implemented without uh, providing some, in effect, penalty for those States uh, that are taking positive and constructive steps to try to address the health care needs of their citizens. And I would yield uh, back to uh, Ms. Capps. I will yield now to the Chairman, Mr. Waxman. Could, could we actually be told, could you read the identifier on the amendment? We have got two different amendments and we don't know which one you all are talking about. Okay, were these offered in block or there was one offered? In block. Clerk will re tell, inform us as to what is pending. Mr. Chairman, my understanding was that um, Mrs. Capps had meant to, well, she mentioned the 4002 amendment, which we distributed, and then we understood that the second amendment of Capps with Mr. Sut uh, Mr. Welch and Ms. Sutton was also to be included. Well, the so amendment that, I'm, that I have in my <coughs> hand says Capps, Sutton, Welch, 001. So, so they have both been distributed now. Does the gentleman uh, from Texas? Uh, we, 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 uh, I, I want you to look at them. We would like to consider them in block. If you would like to divide them, we will divide them because of the fact that uh, they weren't distributed at the same time. Mr. Chairman, I am going to ask for a division. I want, I want to divide the CAPS 4002. Consider it separately. Is that the one you're willing to accept? And accept right and accept that. Okay. All those. Uh, we're going to vote on that particular amendment without objection. We'll divide the uh, question of the two uh, amendments. All those in favor of caps caps o o caps four o o two x m caps four o o two will say aye 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 opposed no the ayes have it and the amendments agreed to the uh, second amendment Ms. Caps I think you ref you spoke I, in I, favor I, of it. The second one was uh, Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch is, and he spoke in favor of it. Uh, is there further debate on that amendment? Uh, yeah, yes, sir. I, I'd like some time Mr. on that. Mr. Blunt. I, I'd be glad to ask Mr. Welch um, on this amendment. Is, is your amendment uh, for a direct, uh, direct uh, uh, negotiating for drug prices under Medicare Part D? Uh, it is not. But uh, don't be disappointed. That's it, it's coming. Well, what what does this one do? This has. Drug negotiations we, for what purpose? We have a uh, we had a waiver, uh, uh, Mr. Blunt, uh, from the federal government that was negotiated by our Republican governor, and what that waiver did is set a cap on how much the federal obligation would be over a five-year period under the Medicaid program. So we were a state that actually took the burden of risk that in the event our Medicaid-eligible population increased the cost of that would be borne by the Vermont taxpayer. The reason we did that, and again, I mentioned it was a, re a Democratic legislature and a Republican governor, was that we got some flexibility uh, on our Medicaid program with respect to eligibility, with respect to the administration of the program. On Medicaid, what, on, on page 4 of your amendment, say, on, on line 7, does this talk about Medicaid or Medicare? Page 4, line 7. Is that yours? Uh, 
Maybe you don't have the same amendment we have. Well, I, no, I do. Page 4, now we're to line 7, section 1186. We have in Vermont a price, a, we, we have a legislation. Right, what, what I'm looking at, Mr. Welch, is the one that says negotiation of lower covered Part D drug prices on behalf of Medicare beneficiaries. Is that in your amendment or not? Yes, it is. And does that do what the title says? Uh, it, the, with the, the negotiations that we have, uh, uh, that actually might inaccurately say Medicare instead of Medicaid. We have a prescription drug uh, negotiation program in Vermont with a formulary that allows uh, the state. Uh, uh, Council, does that section directly amend the Medicare Modernization Act on Medicare Part D? Speak in the you mic. Turn on your mic. It amends Section 1860D, which is in Part D of the Medicare program. So I, I, the answer is yes. I, I don't. The, the the description of the amendment and the amendment don't seem to me to be the same thing, Mr. Welch. And and I'll oppose the amendment. Does anybody else want to speak in opposition? Understandable. Or do you want to withdraw the amendment and come back with an amendment that says that meets your description? I'm not sure. I'm uh, referring with counsel to see if there is any error in what has been distributed. Now, while you're while you're referring to counsel, I re will remind the members that uh, Mr. Holtz Hagen uh, or Mr. Uh, Elmendorf was asked this question specifically the other day by the majority: <coughs> Would direct negotiation with drug companies on Medicare Part D save money? And he said, No, it would not save money. Uh, there are many people in the Medicare Part D program that are already, already eligible to get veterans' drugs, which are negotiated, but they can't get the drugs that their doctor says they need. And a, a high percentage, which I'm hesitant to, to uh, suggest now, but uh, approaching somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 percent, as I recall, of people who would have access to that negotiated program have chosen instead. Uh, to, to get the drugs they want by finding a company that offers them in Medicare Part D, and I'll I'll oppose that will, amendment when it will comes. Will gentleman yield uh, down here? Uh, well, with, right here. I, let me yield, the, Mr. Welch. For yeah, the, let's see first. if yeah. we have the the, the amendment that we want here. I believe this is the wrong amendment being distributed. There is an amendment that I am offering on Medicare Part D, but that is not the one that I'm intending to offer now. Okay. Uh, without objection, the amendment will be withdrawn without so the, prejudice to the gentleman offering the other amendment that he wished to offer. The wrong one has been distributed. I will be glad to oppose the wrong one when it is distributed okay. at the right time. Yeah. Well, let's and I will be glad to give you the opportunity. Well, Mr. Welch, the amendment that has been distributed is the amendment you intended to offer or is that? Apparently not, There's Mr. Chairman. He just said the wrong okay. amendment. Let us withdraw it and are you ready to have the correct amendment distributed and debated at this time or do you want to? Um, I, I want to consult to see what's happened here. Okay, yeah. let's let's move on to uh, another amendment, and then we'll come back. Yeah. Mr. Boyer, you have an amendment. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. It would be Boyer two underscore zero zero one, titled "Programs of Health Promotion of or Disease Prevention." Okay. Mr. Pallone, do you reserve a point of order? Mr. Chairman, I would reserve a point of order. Oh, you've got to eat. Clerk, clerk, have the amendment. Uh, let's be sure we have the right amendment and we distribute the right amendment. We don't. We don't have any amendment. It is. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Boyer of Indiana. At the end of sub, subtitle D of Title I of Division A, add the following, Section 138, Programs of Health Promotion or Disease Prevention. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. And the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Boyer, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With regard to this markup, the theme uh, has been about in health care reform regarding bending the cost curve. Well, I'll add another theme to this. Healthy people cost less. Healthy people cost less. 
Employer-sponsored wellness programs are doing just that, and they have been extremely successful in decreasing costs. President Obama has expressed his support for these programs and their importance in, health, in any health reform package. With greater flexibility to increase incentives, employers will be able to draw more people into their programs, improve the health of more Americans, and decrease health care costs. So why does this belong in this bill? Employers today are providing some of the most innovative tools to improve, of improving health of our population and decreasing health costs. Regarding the bending of the cost curve, these employers have shown that providing employees with incentives to improve their health, they are able to improve, uh, and improve the health of their employees and save money. This is an idea that we should be embracing. It follows common sense that if you provide individuals with financial incentives, they are more likely to work to improve their health care. It is one of the reasons that uh, years ago we created the health savings accounts, trying to bring more personal responsibility back into the equation. The amendment expands upon the success of employer-sponsored wellness programs and allows greater innovation and greater employee participation in programs. The amendment only codifies existing HIPAA regulations and allows employers to provide discounts of up to 50 percent of the total cost of an employee's health care coverage instead of 20 percent allowed under current HIPAA regulations. The amendment would codify existing wellness program regulations and expand existing regulations to allow these programs to grow. The amendment does not change current law regarding uh, HIPAA regulations. They will stand in place to protect individuals' health information. Additionally, a wealth of other Federal and State laws that govern employer-provided wellness programs remain in, in place. I would like to read a quote from uh, President o Obama. He stated uh, in a statement before the American Medical Association on June 15, 2009, the President stated, quote, building a health care system that promotes prevention rather than just managing diseases will require all of us to do our part, and it will take employers following the examples of places like Safeway that is rewarding workers for taking better care of their health while reducing health care costs in the process. If you are one of the three-quarters of Safeway workers enrolled in their Healthy Measures program, you can get screened for problems like high cholesterol or high blood pressure. It's a program. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, the committee is not in order. I can't hear the gentleman. The gentleman is correct. The committee will please come to order. It's a program that has helped Safeway cut health care costs uh, by over 13 percent, and workers save uh, over 20 percent on their premiums. And we are open, open to doing more to help employers adopt and expand programs like this. Now, that's President Obama's comments. So with regard to the theme, I will reiterate, on helping or, or, or strike the word helping, healthy people cost less. If 75 percent of health care costs come from four major conditions, cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes and obesity, if we can have an impact upon human behavior, we can prevent some of these conditions. And that is, in fact, what this amendment uh, is, is all about. With that, I will uh, yield back my time. The gentleman yields back his time. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Ms. Castor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in opposition, opposition to the Boyer Amendment. And to start, I would like to ask unanimous consent that we uh, include in the record and pass out a letter from 60 organizations that oppose the amendment. Mr. Chairman, uh, I think we all Mr. agree that Mr. employers... Chairman, I Mr. Chairman, I want to reserve the right to object. We have not seen that letter. I, I would like to see it before we just give unanimous consent. All right. Then I will go ahead as they pass it out. You all can uh, read it. No uh, unanimous consent has been agreed to. The gentlelady asked that it be put into the record. Was that the request? Yes, and passed out so the members... Okay. Well, let's have it passed out and, and we will uh, have members review it. Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, colleagues, I know we all agree that employers can play a very important role in promoting better health through on-site wellness and prevention initiatives. Well-designed employer-sponsored wellness initiatives improve health outcomes, they increase pro productivity, and they lower health care costs overall. Now, employer wellness programs are covered by HIPAA, and remember that the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act 
prohibits a group health plan from treating members differently based upon their health status. This non-discrimination requirement in HIPAA makes an accommodation for employer-sponsored wellness initiatives but the wellness initiatives must be structured in a non-discriminatory way. And the EEOC has expressed concern over wellness programs that are punitive, uh, such as those that require employees to complete a mandatory health risk assessment, uh, programs that require or, or use monetary penalties, uh, use mandatory medical exams and testing, uh, employer inquiries over about obesity, heart disease, diabe diabetes, or disabilities. And the Boyer Amendment unfortunately takes this tact, and I'd like to suggest to the gentleman if he would withdraw it, we could work on a, on a better structured amendment because appropriate wellness initiatives uh, improve access to preventative services and encourage healthy lifestyles through positive incentives that encourage individuals to be actively engaged in their, their health care, that rec pursue recommended screenings and preventative services, and maintain and improve uh, their health, employees' health through physical activity, good diets, good nutrition, smoking cessation, and other healthy behaviors. Unfortunately, the provisions in the Boyer Amendment give employers and insurers expanded authority to raise premiums based on health status. And in its current form, it promotes the discriminatory programs that could compromise an employee's right to privacy in the workplace. Would, so would the gentlelady yield? I'm almost done. I'm afraid that this amendment would undermine our overriding goal of health reform, which is to provide access uh, to affordable health care in a non-discriminatory way. And we are joined uh, by the American Association of People with Disabilities, the American Cancer Society, the American Heart Association, the American Stroke Association, the American Lung Association, the Epilepsy Foundation, and since he came in second in the Tour de France, I'll mention the Lance Armstrong Foundation, and also want to make it clear on the record that the administration also uh, opposes this amendment. Then I'll the ask gentle, the gentle lady, I'll ask the gentle lady, uh, Yes, I'd like to. to gentle lady has a time. Uh, gentle lady, yield. You have to some you. people you need to yield to. Miss, uh, just. Yes, briefly. I'll go ahead and yield to Mr. Palong. I just wanted to say very briefly. A lot of time was spent in our subcommittee hearings on this issue, and uh, the general consensus, and this is why I oppose the amendment, is that this was something that is very difficult to figure out the balance, so we don't. We don't start discrimination again, but on the other hand, we want to have programs for wellness. And it was suggested basically that this should be left to the regulatory process because it would be very difficult to, you know, to come up with language that would strike the proper balance. So I, I think that the way the amendment is structured, it would continue with some of these discriminatory practices, and therefore I would oppose it at this time. At a request from the other side of the aisle to yes, I'd like to ask uh, my colleague, Mr. Boyer, would you be willing to, to withdraw, and we can work on an amendment that that is um, that avoids the discriminatory tact, uh, but keeps the general idea in uh, in place? Because I know we all agree that the the on-site wellness and prevention programs are vital to to keeping people healthy. So I yield to the gentleman. I, I thank the gentleman for yielding to me. You would made a comment in your statement, uh, ma'am, that, th that this amendment would allow employers to raise premiums. That is false. The, uh, and there is nothing to, uh, that would affect existing anti-discriminatory laws at the federal or state level. So I was very clear in the, in the drafting of this. Um, I wanted, want to, all we are doing is, is uh, an amendment that was adopted in the Senate is very similar. Uh, and they go to 30 percent, I go to 50 percent. So I'm, I'm following a model here that obviously we're going to talk about this at conference. So I, I would prefer to remain with this. this. I'm doing exactly what the Senate is also doing. Well, I yield thank back the to the gentleman gentlelady. and I thank him and I respectfully disagree and would ask uh, unanimous consent again that the, the letter with the 60 organizations in opposition be included in the record. Without objection, that will be the order. Now, uh, We've done five minutes on each side. I want to recognize 
Mr. Boyer, do you want to control the time for another five-minute round? It's your thank amendment, you, and I know members on your side, Mr. Gingrey, thank particularly you. want to speak. yield to Mr. Gingrey for one minute. Uh, and I thank the gentleman for yielding. And I, you know, I, the, the gentlelady from Florida, uh, I, I respectfully disagree. I mean, how, <clears throat> how is it punitive or discriminatory uh, when you're not raising the premiums for those who uh, participate in a wellness program. Uh, what uh, Mr. Booyah, uh, what his amendment is, says is that we ought to, to uh, encourage this kind of activity, not discourage it. Uh, companies like Safeway and others that have uh, shown tr tremendous savings uh, by rewarding, incentivizing their, their employees to participate in wellness programs. I mean, that's what this, this should be all about, but to think that uh, uh, you would you would think that other people who choose not to participate are being discriminated. What's discriminatory uh, about them paying the standard rate, the standard group rate for the health insurance policy, but rewarding others who who uh, lower the cost by their behavior? I don't. I, I reclaim my time and yield one minute to Mr. Shimkus. Uh, I want to thank my colleague. This is exactly the reason why we fear the public option, which we believe is the gateway drug to a one-payer system. It's going to drive care to the lowest denominator. Here's what we're saying. We're saying wellness is bad. Let's penalize it. Let's drive it down to the lowest denominator so we don't make wellness a part of the program. This is exactly why we're going in the wrong direction. I uh, support my colleagues of amendment. I yield back. Thank you. I yield to Mr. Terry. One minute. Thank you. Uh, the language in here that of opposition, frankly, I think these groups are just wrong in the gentlelady uh, from Florida it says that charging individuals different premiums is wrong. So it's this everybody has to pay the same, everything's going to be equal, but we need to look at healthy models. We talk about this in this committee, but yet when we want to incent healthy behavior, we can't because everybody has to be treated the same. We aren't punishing those that are morbidly obese and refuse to change their behavior, smoke too much, and drink too much. We're going to, in essence, force those that are healthy to subsidize those. I think that's just a bad policy. Thank you. Reclaim my time. And let me, in closing, this is, vo this is a voluntary program. We should be promoting the personal responsibility, encourage prevention, and wellness. Healthy people cost less. The, soft, the, the Safeway uh, model here, Safeway saved $52.2 million versus their earlier cost trends between 2005 and 2009. And the calculation was based on 22,253 covered employees and their covered family members in 2009. So we can create greater incentives by linking healthy behaviors to financial incentives such as these lower, uh, lower co-pays or and uh, I think it's something that we really we should be doing. We, we have this uh, in the uh, automobile sector and uh, it's something we should, my gosh, if, it's, if we get good driver discounts and we give to our children, you get a discount. If you got straight A's, I mean, we incentivize, incentivize and that's what we should be doing. I yield to Dr. Murphy. Uh, Mr. Burry, a couple questions for you, if you would. Uh, with regard to what you were just referring to with automobile insurance, am I correct in that if a person has a good driving record, uh, no accidents, no tickets, their rate for their auto insurance would be less than, for example, a person with multiple DUIs, multiple collisions, uh, uh, multiple speeding tickets? That's correct. Uh, and, uh, and yet we are not permitted to do that in this bill the way it stands now with regard to someone who may um, voluntarily smoke or uh, not take care of themselves uh, versus those who would voluntarily do all they can to keep up their health, see a doctor regularly, uh, and not smoke. I, I want to be very clear, th reclaim my time. The protections under current law are not affected by this amendment. So the HIPAA regulations that prohibit group health plans from discriminating based on health factors remains in place. The Department of Labor's field assistance bulletin number 2008-02 remains in place. The Americans with Disability Act remains in place. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and their prohibitions remain in place. Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act remains in place. State laws and federal laws on anti-discrimination remain in place. So what, I do, what I'm doing is codifying the present regulation and trying to encourage wellness programs. I yield back to Mr. 
Dr. Murphy. So we, uh, I'm just imagining a, a conversation between two people, one person who jogs and exercises, sees the doctor, takes good care of themselves, eats right, and all those things that this committee has dealt with before with regard to food safety, with regard to encouraging people to not smoke and engaging good behaviors, uh, sitting next to someone who does smoke, who doesn't take care of themselves, and the person who doesn't take care of themselves realizing that they are they're, uh, the other person's taxes pay for them. I would think that would be an interesting conversation. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, we've had uh, uh, ten minutes on the one side. Is there anybody? Uh, Mr. Markey, you wish to be recognized. Uh, we're entitled to five minutes. If you take less, it would be appreciated. We can get to the vote. Okay. I will, I will move very quickly. And uh, just begin by saying that auto insurance is not the same as health insurance. A driver can choose not to speed, but a person can't change her DNA, her heredity. Um, uh, it's pretty easy to figure out who has had an accident or not, and then encourage or discourage that in the future with your premiums. Okay? This is a lot different over here in healthcare. It's a completely different ball of wax. So the gentlelady from Florida has an amendment that's going to come up in a little while that deals with this issue uh, in a way that, that doesn't act in such a coercive way uh, to say to people that the price you have to pay uh, in order to um, receive lower premiums is that you have to give away your privacy. Uh, you have to compromise these other values that are important. Here's, here's a, a form that one company uh, gives to uh, to people, employees and small companies to fill out. Um, is this something you want people to have to answer? Uh, I am planning on becoming pregnant uh, in the next six months. I am not currently pregnant. I'm not planning on becoming pregnant in the next six months. These are the kind of questions that you have to answer in order to get a discount. Huh? Well, if you're in a wellness program, if you're working to improve your overall well-being, that should be what is the condition for receiving this benefit. What Ms. Castor is going to propose is something that's a much better balance, that doesn't compromise the individual identity of the person and all of her individuality uh, as the price uh, to enter a wellness program. And, and I think if we wait for this better balanced amendment that uh, the gentlelady from uh, Florida has, that we'll be in a lot better situation. To pretend that in these companies, let's say it's a 10-person company, that somehow or other all of the most intimate secrets of a family, of their medical history, is not going to be compromised, is to really hope for something uh, that might exist in another world, but not the world that we live in. So let's not allow that to be conditioned. And, and I would like to yield one more time down to the gentlelady from Florida, just so that she can have another, uh, another opportunity to expand upon how her proposal will differ, will differ but still achieve the same end. Well, I, I thank my colleague very much, and I, I think we've had a uh, good debate on this. And we all agree that uh, prevention and these wellness programs are very important cost savers for companies, and also uh, they're a great cost saver for employees and, and our families. And I would hope that we would all we would work together moving forward to ensure that we're not being overly intrusive, we're structuring it correctly in a non-discriminatory way that uh, provides all the benefits necessary. And I'll yield back. Great. I thank the gentlelady. Now I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. All time has expired. We will now proceed to the vote on the Boyer Amendment. Um, Mr. Boyer, you're going to have a roll call vote if you don't win? Please. Okay, let's go to a roll call vote. Mr. Waxman? No. Mr. Waxman, no. Mr. Dingle? Mr. Dingle, no. Mr. Markey? No. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Boucher? Mr. Pallone? Mr. Pallone, no. Mr. Gordon? Mr. Rush? Ms. Eshoo? Ms. Eshoo, no. Mr. Stupak? Mr. Stupak, no. Mr. Engel? Mr. Green? Mr. Green, no. Mr. Gett? 
Mr. Gap, no. Mrs. Caps, Mrs. Caps, no. Mr. Doyle, Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon, Ms. Harmon, no. Ms. Schakowsky, Ms. Schakowsky, no. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Inslee, no. Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin, no. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross, Mr. Weiner, Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Matheson, Mr. Butterfield, Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melanson, Mr. Barrow. Mr. Hill, Mrs. Christensen, Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor, Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes, Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut, Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space, Mr. McNerney, Mr. McNerney, aye. Ms. Sutton, Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley, Mr. Braley, aye. No. I'm sorry, off. <laughs> Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch, Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton, Mr. Barton, aye. Mr. Hall, Mr. Hall, aye. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns, Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield, Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus, Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck, Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Blunt, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Boyer, Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Radonovich. Mr. Mr. Rodonovich, aye. Mr. Pitts, Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bono Mac, Ms. Bono Mac, aye. Mr. Walden, Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry, Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers, Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingri. Mr. Gingri, aye. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise, aye. Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel votes no. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush votes no. Mr. Green. I'm sorry, do I have green? No. I, it's Mr. Ms. Matsui. I'm sorry. Ms. Matsui votes no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher votes no. Mrs. Myrick. Yes. Mrs. Myrick is aye. Have all members responded to the call of the roll? Anyone wish to change his or her vote? If not, uh, the clerk will tally the vote. Right, hold it. We have somebody else coming. Mr. Mr. Barrow, I don't believe you are recorded. <laughs> Gentlemen wish to vote. Okay. Gentlemen will state his Mr. vote. Mr. Barrow. No. Mr. Barrow votes no. Mr. H Mr. Hill. No. Mr. Hill votes no. Mr. Space. Mr. Space. No. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, no. Mr. Gordon, no. Anyone else? Clerk. Mr. Mel Melanson, no. 
Mr. Ross? No. Mr. Ross, no. Ms. Baldwin is recorded as voting no. Is he here? Okay. Clerk will tally the vote. Mr. Mr. Rush? Hi. Mr. Rush is recorded as no. Is it, is it, have all members responded to the roll? Clerk will report the vote. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, there were 24 ayes and 34 noes. 24 ayes, 34 noes. The amendment's not agreed to. Who do we go to now? Is Mr. Welch ready? Mr. Welch, do you have uh, your amendment? Uh, I do. Uh, Could the clerk re report uh, the amendment and um, pass out the amendment as well? Um, oh, it's this one. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3200 offered by Mr. Welch of Vermont. In the subsection a one way of reading without objection added. the amendment will be considered as read and the clerk uh, and the and the gentleman from Vermont is recognized for five minutes but if we could have it distributed have we had it distributed okay uh, it is being distributed and I want to thank the staff uh, we're now having distributed the correct amendment and as I uh, was explaining earlier uh, this addresses a Medicaid waiver that the state of Vermont negotiated with the federal government whereby uh, the state took on the burden of risk about the potential of increasing Medicare expenses through enrollment uh, in an exchange the federal government extended to Vermont significant flexibility including in who could be eligible for benefits. What this amendment would do is say that in the event that the health care legislation in the underlying bill is passed into law. Vermont would not be penalized uh, by its current eligibility standards and instead uh, would get to be treated like any other state with respect to who is eligible for Medicaid and how the federal government would participate in that financial, uh, impl the implication financially of that. Uh, this is being uh, presented at the request of uh, our governor and legislature. Uh, it's Governor uh, Douglas, uh, who, was the, uh, who was the governor at the time this Medicaid waiver was negotiated with the Bush administration. At the time, I was the Senate president and was fully in support of it. Uh, so basically, the bottom line here is that it would allow Vermont uh, to be treated the same as any other state in the event that the underlying legislation is passed into law. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. Mr. Chairman, could I have some time? Mr. Blunt is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, couple of questions of counsel. It's my understanding that the underlying bill would mm -hmm. prohibit this kind of agreement being made in the future. Is that is that correct? I don't see any other reason for this amendment if that's not correct. But if you could help me with that, the the underlying bill has a maintenance of eligibility requirement that applies to all states. Yes. Um, for their Medicaid populations and for their child health insurance program populations. It, it, all, it, it applies to states whether they have a Section 1115 waivers or not. Um, Mr. Welsh's state has a Section 1115 waiver with a, with a unique characteristic. This amendment tries to address that unique characteristic but otherwise applies the same maintenance of eligibility requirement to uh, Vermont as it does to the other states. Right. So what, what makes the amendment necessary is, is a feature of the Vermont waiver. But no, no other state would be able to enter into a waiver similar to Vermont's after this bill passed. Sir, this, this amendment and the underlying bill do nothing to change the existing authority that the Secretary has to grant waivers to states under Section 1115. Then why is it necessary? 
the, the maintenance of eligibility requirement in the bill would extend current state eligibility rules, including those in Vermont under its 1115 waiver. There is a specific class of individuals in the Vermont waiver uh, to which the extension makes no sense. And this amendment allows the Secretary in the State of Vermont to address that specific situation. But if I would ask counsel again if in the line 2 and 3, if you said in the case of a State waiver under section 1115 and then less left out the words in effect on June 16, 2009 that permits individuals to be eligible exactly as it reads, then any State could any state could do this uh, without the effective date, or why? Why are we doing the, this? The effective date, sir, is is, is, the, is the is the base for the maintenance of eligibility. The maintenance of eligibility requirement is tied to eligibility standards, methodologies, and procedures in effect on June 16, 2009. That's six. That's, we, that's six weeks ago. That's in the base bill. Yes, sir. That's in the base bill. Yes, sir. It's on page 764, line four. On page June 16, 2009 is in the base bill. Yes. So that would become the base for everybody except for Vermont because they have a waiver? Uh, no, sir. That is, that, that is the base for everybody. It would yeah, remain Vermont. the base for everybody, including Vermont, under this amendment. Um, the reason the reference is in here is because the rules that uh, Vermont had in effect on June 16, 2009, were under its waiver. But no other state in the future could get that same waiver that Vermont well, had. Well, any June other 16. state that had a waiver that permits individuals to be eligible solely to receive a premium or cost-sharing subsidy for individual or group health insurance, that's this little unique feature of the Vermont 1115 waiver. Okay, I, th I think Mr. Deal has a unanimous consent request. I'd better go to him. Well, I'd like to ask counsel some questions first, if I might. Counsel, um, we're talking here about um, 1115 waivers. Can you tell us how many 1115 waivers there are mm -hmm. across the country? Sir, I don't have the answer to that on the top of my head. I, I've, I've been told it's something in the neighborhood of 650 1115 waivers granted to states in various fashions. And we are singling out only one 1115 waiver in this amendment uh, to grant an exemption from the underlying bill for. Is that correct? It, 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 let me put this in a context. It's not an exception. When Vermont, in its waiver, which is unique, because what we did, Mr. Deal, was take on as a state the risk of rising eligibility in Medicaid without and gave up our right to federal higher reimbursement in exchange for flexibility. We then used that to make more people in our state eligible for Medicaid. And what this will do is say that Vermont can rewrite with the federal government that portion of its commitment to eligibility for people above who will be covered under this bill so that, in effect, will be held financially harmless. I, I understand the gentleman. Uh, as I read your amendment, it simply says that you can continue as the State of Vermont to allow premium assistance uh, for individuals who are Medicaid eligible and allow premium assistance for them to buy into their employer plan, for example. That's, that's correct. Yes, sir. Uh, yesterday, I offered an amendment that would have extended that opportunity to every state in the country. How did you vote on my amendment yesterday? Uh, I can't remember, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if when we checked the record, I voted uh, against it. But and so there today, you're asking us to extend to Vermont what you were not willing to extend to the other states in the country yesterday. Will the gentleman yield to me? Yeah. We yeah. do have the uh, voluntary uh, ability of states to, uh, to do what I, I believe this to be the case, but what your amendment would have done was to mandate the states to do it. So. Why then are we having to amend and, and give one state an exclusion from Section 1703 of the underlying bill, which, as I read it, puts prohibitions on uh, future 1115 waivers, except in the case of this amendment for one state? Am I well, correct in that interpretation? I, I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield to the gentleman. 
I, I don't think you are, Mr. Deal. What this does is deal with a practical problem. Vermont took on the financial burden of providing benefits to folks up to, uh, on its own tab, higher than the requirements under the Medicaid program. Uh, that was a financial burden it took on because it felt that with the administrative flexibility that it negotiated in the Medicaid waiver, we would be able to accrue savings and then return those to citizens in the form of benefits. Under the underlying bill, if it is passed into law, Vermont wants to have the same treatment with the Federal Government on the benefit package as every other State. What this legislation is intended to do very simply is allow the State and the Federal Government to rewrite a contractual provision in the waiver. As you know, that waiver that the State signs has very stringent obligations that impose burdens on both sides. We want to rewrite that so that it conforms Vermont and the eligibility section uh, of the underlying legislation with every other State. So it is a fix for a problem uh, that Vermont uniquely has. That is correct but it doesn't change any of the rules for any other state and it doesn't confer on Vermont. Well, re reclaiming the time very quickly, as I read the underlying um, portion of the bill you want to change, that provision states that as a condition of a state plan under this title and as a condition for receiving any federal financial assistance, a state shall not have in effect eligibility standards, methodologies or procedures under its state child health plan uh, including waivers under Section 1115 that are more restrictive than the eligibility standards, methodologies, or procedures reflected under the base plan. So other states would not have the ability to restrict their plans, but we are excluding Vermont who would be given the authority to, to do that. No. Council, is that correct? No, I, I believe it is not correct, Mr. Well, I was asking Council. Oh, I am sorry. Uh, for the class of individuals covered under the Vermont waiver that are eligible solely to receive a premium for cost sharing subsidy for individual or group health insurance coverage, the answer to your question is yes. Thank that you. That small class of individuals. I yield back. Uh, Let us proceed to the vote. All those in favor of the Welch Amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Mr. Barton, you have an amendment. I have an amendment at the desk. It is um, uh, CR 44001 XML dealing with the physician owned hospitals. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank the gentleman, and it is, um, I mean, thank the chairman who is a gentleman. And uh, I um, intend to discuss this and in all probability withdraw it, but I feel very strongly about this. Uh, section 156 of the pending bill beginning on page 318 and going through page 334 uh, I basically outlaws uh, a physician to own or what are called specialty hospitals. Uh, this amendment would yeah. strike that section in its entirety. Um, most hospitals or clinics that were established in the United States up until about 100 years ago or maybe even 50 years ago were owned by physicians. Uh, it is the heart of the American practice of medicine. The most famous hospitals in America uh, uh, either started out and are still are physician owned or specialty hospitals like the Mayo Clinic, uh, Johns Hopkins in uh, Baltimore. In my state, uh, MD Anderson, uh, Scott and White in Temple, Texas. Um, not every state allows today uh, physicians to have an interest, uh, an equity ownership interest in, in hospitals. Uh, but in those states that do, uh, they have some of the highest, and I, in fact, I would say they have the highest quality ratings, uh, patient satisfaction ratings. Uh, I am blessed in my congressional district to have a number of uh, physician-owned hospitals. Uh, I have been treated in those hospitals. I have gone to the emergency room um, in these hospitals. Uh, and without it, my, my mother has been in one of these without exception. Uh, the experience has been uh, 
uh, as good as it could be given the, con the situation that, that resulted in it. Uh, the pending bill for some reason is punitive on these types of, of facilities. Um, uh, would at a minimum um, yeah. prevent their expansion uh, uh, in all probability ca cause a number of them to close. Uh, if you read the language that my amendment strikes, it is, um, um, it, is, it is punitive in nature and very restrictive. There are some limited exceptions where you can appeal to the Secretary of HHS. Um, but um, I really think that if, if we are going to have a robust health care system, uh, you have to give uh, the providers and practitioners of that health care some opportunity where it is allowed by state law to participate uh, in, in, in owning uh, and having an equity interest in the facilities in which they um, perform their health care services. Uh, my, my amendment does nothing but maintain the status quo. If it is adopted, uh, we will go back to where we are today where each state makes a decision whether they allow this type of um, an ownership interest uh, and if they do under what terms and conditions it is allowed. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would um, Will the gentleman yield? I would be happy to yield. Uh, sure. I simply want to uh, strongly support the gentleman's amendment. In Arizona we have a number of physician-owned hospitals. They have lower mortality rates, lower infection rates, uh, more satisfied uh, patient rates. Uh, they are an example of how health care should be run. Uh, we can look at any perverse incentives, but to ban them all outright is just wrong, and I support the gentleman's amendment. Okay. I want to yield, yield, yield to uh, Mr. Booyer, then Mr. Terry, then but Dr. Burgess. At a time when we are working on improving health outcomes and reducing readmissions to hospitals, your amendment is where we should be going. So I want to thank the gentleman, and I, and I hope you don't withdraw it. Um, competition in the marketplace occurs if we are if going to wipe out specialty hospitals. Hospitals around the country will enjoy monopoly status and it will begin a stagnation uh, as to quality, and that is not good. Okay. I yield. Mr. Terry. Thank you. I want to associate myself with your remarks and uh, ask for support for this amendment, although uh, admittingly part of my reasoning is parochial. Uh, there is a partially physician-owned hospital being built in a very underserved area of my district near Offutt Air Force Base. Uh, with about, uh, I think there's around 60, 70,000 people that live around that area. It is 80 percent built. Under the language that's currently in this bill, uh, they will not be eligible to take f uh, Medicare or Medicaid because they did not receive their Medicare re authorization as of the date. So I support and want this amendment to pass. Yield back. Uh, and Dr. Uh, Burgess. And I encourage the gentleman to not withdraw his amendment, but to have us vote on it. This is an extremely important topic. As, as Mr. Terry already pointed out, the retroactive nature of the language in the base bill is, is unnecessarily punitive. And I, I just cannot imagine how we can restrict, in America, how we can restrict a lawful business just based on the, from the standpoint of someone's professional degree. It, it really flies in the face of America's freedom. And then the other thing is, there's nothing like the pride of ownership. When you own something, you want it to be the best. I know that because I've been involved in some of these facilities, and, it, and, and truly, they do strive for excellence. I thank the gentleman. I'll yield back to Mr. Barton. My time's expired. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez, do you wish to uh, speak on this amendment? Y yes, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I reluctantly oppose it for the following reasons. What we have here are two e almost extremes at the end of the spectrum those that don't recognize the abuses and shortfall, uh, shortcomings of doctor-owned hospitals, which do exist, and those others that would s simply say, let's allow business as usual. Now, I will tell you that I attended a meeting um, hosted by Mr. Rangel where we had people from CMS, and I wasn't very happy with the attitude, the approach, or the philosophy when it comes to physician-owned hospitals. This is what they said. They don't really take Medicare patients. There is no emergency rooms. That is not true. And it, no. Just, that is not And it true. costs more. No, I, Mr. Barton, I am actually going to agree with you here. Gentleman from Texas, but I Mr. Want to give Gonzalez you has the time. A true picture of what a physician-owned hospital can do and do it well. But what CMS and what we have had in place for some time discourages the really good actors 
Unfortunately, this amendment will allow for the bad actors. Somewhere in the middle lies the answer. Now, everything that CMS represented to me was entirely inapplicable to one of the best hospitals in San Antonio, which is physician-owned. Texan Heart Hospital. It has 24-7 full-service ER staffed by board-certified ER physicians. 51 percent of the patients treated at Texan are covered by Medicare. Texan is the third rated cardiac program in the state of Texas and in the top 10 percent of all U.S. heart programs as determined by health grades. Uh, it exceeded in the 90 percent, uh, percentile on overall patient satisfaction uh, as gauged by CMS. It outperforms its larger competitors on many of the key uh, core process, uh, processes and charges actually less than the general hospitals. The problem with CMS, and I believe the problem with the provision as we presently find it, is it doesn't recognize the efficiencies and competence of hospitals like Texan, which is uh, physician owned. By the same token, we can't close our eyes to some of the abuses and shortcomings as I earlier stated. Why aren't we working with some sort of measurement that will allow for physician-owned hospitals that perform within certain guidelines and when yes. they do it well, and which will protect us from any of the abuses that are out there in today's operations by some of the hospitals that are constantly used as the poster children for the abuses. Would the gentleman yield? The gentleman yield. Gentleman Only yield? if you agree with me. Uh, well, I do agree. I, if no, I'm, I'm, I'm being facetious, and of course I would. No, I, I, do, I do agree with what you said, and I think you, you talked about the good and the bad actors, and I think that the underlying bill accomplishes that. And I have to say, and I was at rules several times when we dealt with the CHAMP Act, 2 o'clock in the morning, listening to the Texas guys talk about this, and I think that the underlying bill accomplishes the goal because basically it says that Hospitals that had Medicare provider agreements in effect on January 1st this year are grandfathered. There is even an allowance in the underlying bill for some expansion uh, of those hospitals uh, where the community needs uh, more hospital capacity and doesn't require any restructuring for any currently operating hospital with a provider and agreement. And the chairman of the subcommittee, I have to reclaim my time because I have got a minute. But this is where Mr. Barton does make some sense. because. Yes, we have those provisions, but it really stops any future endeavors that may mimic the outstanding qualifications and performance of hospitals like Texan. Yes, if you have a Medicare number, and the grandfather in date is actually January 2009. You know what that is telling us. It is going to stop it in its tracks, which I disagree with. And I think there is a way to addressing, as I have said, the inherent problems that we have out there that we should safeguard against without doing away with the whole notion of physician-owned hospitals. Well, uh, gentlemen, I just, if, if the gentleman, yeah, I just wanted to point out that the way this is structured in the underlying bill, um, it does uh, allow for those that exist now to continue and even to expand under certain circumstances. I, I just wanted to make that point clear that a lot of time was spent in trying to deal with this in a way that I think is fair for those that, that currently exist. No, no, and, and I accept that because that is an accurate statement. But my point is that it really is finite. We are fixed where we are today, and it is the end of the physician on hospitals, which I think is not the proper course to take. But I will still oppose this amendment because I think it doesn't make that distinction, and we must make that very important distinction. And I yield back to the Chairman. The gentleman yields back his time. Mr. Barton. Thank you. And, and this is one of the ones that I'm going to use 10 minutes on because it's really, really important. Now, I, I listened to what Congressman Gonzalez just said. And when, when he started his, uh, his comments, I interrupted him and I apologize uh, because I strongly disagreed with what he was saying, but he was saying that as a, as a predicate to then say what he said about the hospital in his district, which apparently is one of the uh, outstanding uh, physician-owned hospitals. Here's the, here's, the here's the dilemma that we're in. There are approximately 250 physician-owned specialty hospitals in America. 
There are many states, for whatever reason, that don't want to allow them at all. We're not trying to preempt state law and, and allow a physician-to-own hospital where the state doesn't allow it. But where the states do allow it, we believe that in the overwhelming majority, these hospitals rank at the top in every category in terms of quality, performance, cost, outcomes, you name it. However you, however you evaluate a hospital, these hospitals are at the top. Now, there may be a few problem physician-owned hospitals, but those are the exception, not the rule. This bill bans any expansion. It does have a limited exception for a, somewhere between five and ten hospitals, which is very arbitrary. So what I, when I hear Congressman Gonzalez, he says he wants to fix the problem. I don't hear him saying he wants to ban them. I am more than willing to work with Mr. Gonzalez and you know, Mr. Pallone and Mr. Waxman, anybody on this committee, if there are truly problems, if we need to put special parameters, let's do it, but let's don't outlaw one of the mechanisms for innovation and quality that exist. And I feel very, very strong. This is the, the only amendment we've had in four days that I have felt strongly enough to speak twice on. Because this is, if not the future of health care in America, it is one of the pathways to a better future for health care in America. And the pending bill stops it in its tracks. So I want to ask Physician my on. friends on the majority, from the chairman, the subcommittee chairman, are there any of you that actually want to work and identify these problems, and if there are problems, fix them in a bipartisan way? Do we have any interest at all? Congressman Issue, Congresswoman Issue. Uh, thank you uh, for yielding. Um, I, I think that uh, this is a very important conversation. Uh, because uh, uh, when you uh, talk about MD Anderson, uh, I think that we're all aware um, of individuals that have sought that very special place out, um, that it has been life-saving, uh, and that there are others that reflect the same quality. Now, MD uh, Anderson quality. Is, is not physician-owned today, but it started out. It started out that way. Um, I, I don't want to kill gooses and golden eggs and all of that. I think, as I understand this issue, and what is troubling to me about physician-owned facilities, uh, Mr. Barton, is uh, that it really is an exchange of taking money out of one pocket and putting it in the other in the same uh, pair of pants. Uh, there's the, um, you know, the tendency uh, or the motivation for the physicians to, um, you know, to oversubscribe, to overutilize. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know what you have built into what your suggestion is that would address that. Um, you know, I mean, we, we have to watch costs. We have to cut costs. And uh, these practices are uh, bending the curve in a, uh, in a negative way. Uh, Mr. So Green, that, that's, my, that's my question. And I, I think that that may be on the minds of other I'm, members I'm as very well. willing to work Thank in you. that direction. Congressman Green. Thank you for yielding to me in the last 15 seconds. Uh, I recognize the problem because in urban, very poor areas, if we didn't have physician-owned hospitals, the large nonprofits will not move into our neighborhood. We do have for-profits who are there historically, but I have hospitals that have been there since the 60s that wouldn't be there without physician-owned. Uh, I was born in a Catholic hospital that's now a physician-owned hospital in downtown Houston. Uh, this amendment. Uh, they're grandfathered in under the original one, uh, but 500-bed hospital was shut down in bankruptcy, and now we're trying to find somebody to do it, uh, take it over in Central City, Houston. So there's a need for what uh, we need to look at this instead of just a meat axe approach to abolishing it all. Do I have I'm, I, do I have the um, assurances of the chairman and the subcommittee chairman? You'll actually work with us to try to find a middle ground on this. If you'll yield to me, I'll certainly be pleased to work with you and see if we can. Uh, 
reach an accommodation. And Mr. Pallone? Uh, I'll agree to it as well, but I will, uh, a word of caution, and that is that, you know, the other committee, because uh, we have joint jurisdiction with Ways and Means, and I know that they uh, were involved with uh, putting this together, too, in the underlying bill. So we'd have to, that's the, that's the caveat that we'd have to consult with them as well. Well, Chairman Rangel has agreed to work with Congressman Johnson, and we can do that on a bicameral, bipartisan, by committee basis. I just, I just want, I don't want to let something that is as good as and important as, as this. I have spoken with the leadership of the special. They are more than willing to come to the table and whatever the real problems are, address them in a forthright fashion. If we will just get a commitment that we'll do that, and I think we're getting that commitment. So with that, Mr. You Chairman. Are. I am uh, withdrawing the amendment. The gentleman withdraws his amendment. Uh, we are going to have votes on the House floor shortly. I also uh, understand our staffs on a bipartisan basis are going to go over the amendments and try to cull through them, uh, prioritize them, maybe bundle them together so that we can move faster this afternoon. It is my hope, I can't give any guarantee, but it is my hope that we can conclude this markup uh, by 4 or 5 at the latest in the afternoon. But whatever time it takes, we are going to complete this bill today. So I am going to call for a recess Mr. and ask Mr. members, if, if I can finish, oh, yeah. ask members to come back after the votes, immediately after the last vote on the House floor. Who asked me to yield? Mr. Chairman. Yield to me and Mr. Then Barton. Yield to Mr. Just uh, as I understand, uh, there is one amendment, my amendment, that you folks are going to accept. We could probably do that right now. Well, there, there, we'll, we'll put all the amendments we are going to accept together and see if we can move them all together. Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, I agree. I have already agreed privately with what you just said, that we have a brief recess in which we try to have the staffs coordinate. Um, I would like your assurances, which you have given me privately, that uh, the key amendments, uh, the, whatever the blue dog um, compromise is that it will be made available for two hours so that we can review it or you, you I can make that commitment? I, th I think that is a reasonable request and we will uh, make the amendment amendments that we are going to have uh, available to you uh, two hours before the vote. And then the uh, some of the priority amendments, we still have the SU Barton Biologics Bill. Uh, we have a um, uh, bipartisan There There are a number of amendments and we are going to get to them and certainly any amendment that is a priority you, to you we'll bring up and we'll try to meet everybody's priorities well, on the committee. With that understanding, Mr. Chairman, we, we're more than willing on the minority side to work with you to expedite to the extent it's possible. Um, we understand how hard you've worked on this and how difficult it is. And, um, you know, we would like to see it concluded today, but we also want to make sure that all the issues that need to be addressed are addressed in a, uh, in a forthright fashion. I think that is a reasonable request. We will work together to accomplish it. We will stand in recess until after the last vote on the floor.
So the House Energy and Commerce Committee now in a break for uh, pending votes on the floor of the House. You uh, may have already uh, may have heard uh, Chairman Henry Waxman saying that he still does plan to finish up work on the health care bill today. So uh, we will continue our coverage here on C-SPAN through. We will see it through uh, however long they uh, go today with this markup here in the Rayburn House office building. One of the uh, senators involved with health care legislation, uh, news about uh, Senator Chris Dodd today from the Associated Press that he has been diagnosed with prostate cancer. Senator Dodd planned to announce the diagnosis at a news conference in Hartford, Connecticut this afternoon. Uh, he is the chairman of the Senate Banking Committee, the five-term senator up for re-election next year. The officials that, that gave word on this uh, spoke on condition of anonymity because they were not authorized to discuss the senator's health. But uh, Senator Dodd, uh, apparently, according to the Associated Press, has been diagnosed with prostate cancer. The Associated Press also reporting that uh, Democrats on the key House committee that you've been uh, watching here, the House Energy and Commerce Committee, have patched up their differences on health care reform. The chairman of the committee, Henry Waxman, says all sides agreed that they needed to pull together. He says liberals, moderates, and conservatives negotiated late into the night last night to reach a deal. Uh, but the chairman says he intends to uh, formally present that deal to the committee today, and the panel should pass the bill this afternoon, the last-minute agreement satisfied liberals who were outraged by a deal uh, Congressman Waxman struck earlier in the week with conservatives known as the Blue Dog Democrats. Again, that from the Associated Press. The House Energy and Commerce Committee in a break now for votes on the House floor. And uh, while that uh, continues, we'll show you a portion of today's Washington Journal when we heard from a member of the Congressional Progressive Caucus about the health care debate. the table, Congressman Donna Edwards, who is not a member of the committee, but obviously uh, very vocal on the issue of health care. And you're calling this agreement with the Blue Dog Democrats fundamentally...